Hello, um, my name is Golan Levin. Uh, I'm an artist and an engineer, which is increasingly a more common kind of hybrid. But I still fall into this weird crack where people don't seem to understand me. And, and um, uh, I was looking around and I, I found this wonderful picture. It's a letter from Art Forum in 1967 saying, we can't imagine ever doing a special issue on electronics or computers and art. And they still haven't. And lest you think that, that you all, as the, as the digerati, are more enlightened, I, I went to the Apple uh, iPhone app store the other day. Where's art? I got productivity, I got sports, and somehow the idea that, that one would want to make art for the iPhone, which my friends and I are doing now, is still not reflected in our understanding of what computers are for. So from both directions, there's kind of, I think, a lack of understanding about what it could mean to be an artist who uses the materials of his own day or her own day, uh, which I think uh, artists are obliged to do, is to really explore the expressive potential of the new tools that we have. In my own case, uh, I'm an artist, and I'm really interested in uh, expanding the vocabulary of human action and, uh, and basically empowering people through interactivity. I want people to discover themselves as actors uh, by having, as creative actors, by having interactive experiences. Now, a lot of my work is about trying to get away from this. This is the photograph of the desktop of a student of mine. And when I say desktop, I don't just mean the actual desk where his mouse is worn away, the surface of the desk. If you look carefully, you can even see a hint of the Apple menu up here in the upper left, where the virtual world has literally punched through to the physical. So, um, the, this is, uh, as Joy Mountford once said, the, the, the mouse is probably the narrowest straw you could try and suck all of human expression through. And uh, it, the, the thing I really am trying to do is, in, in enabling people to have more rich kinds of, of interactive experiences, how can we get away from the mouse and use our full bodies as a way of, of exploring aesthetic experiences, not necessarily utilitarian ones? So. I write software, and that's how I do it. And, and uh, a lot of my experiences uh, resemble mirrors in some way, because this is, in some sense, the first way that people discover their own potential as actors and discover their own agency, by seeing who's that person in the mirror. Oh, it's actually me. And so, to give an example, this is a project from last year which is called the Interstitial Fragment Processor, and it allows people to explore the negative shapes that they create when they're just going about their everyday business. So as people make shapes with their hands or their heads and so forth or with each other, these shapes literally produce sounds and drop out of thin air, basically taking what's often this kind of unseen space or this, this undetected space and making it something real that people then can appreciate and become creative with. So again, people discover uh, their creative agency in this way and their own personalities come out in, in totally unique ways. So. Um, in addition to using full body input, something that I've uh, explored now for a while has been the use of the voice, uh, which is an immensely expressive uh, system for, for, uh, for us vocalizing. Song is one of our oldest uh, ways of, of making ourselves heard and understood. And I came across this fantastic research by Wolfgang Kohler, the so-called father of Gestalt psychology from 1927, who submitted to an audience like yourselves the following two shapes. And he said one of them is called Maluma and one's called Takita, which is which. And anyone want to hazard a guess? Maluma's on top. Yeah, so it's, uh, as he says here, most people answer without any hesitation. So what we're really seeing here is a phenomenon called phonesthesia, which is a kind of synesthesia that all of you have. And so whereas Dr. Oliver Sacks has talked about how perhaps one person in a million actually has true synesthesia, where they hear colors or taste shapes and things like this, phonesthesia is something we can all experience to some extent. It's about mappings between different perceptual domains, like hardness, sharpness, brightness, and darkness, and the phonemes that we're able to speak with. So 70 years on, there's been some research where cognitive psychologists have actually sussed out the extent to which you know, L, M, and B are more associated with shapes that look like this, and P, T, and K are perhaps more associated with shapes like this. And here we suddenly begin to have a mapping between curvature uh, that we can exploit numerically, relative mapping between curvature and, and shape. So it occurred to me, what happens if we could run these backwards? And thus was born this project called Remark, which was a collaboration with Zachary Lieberman and the uh, Ars Electronica Future Lab. 
And this is an interactive installation which presents the fiction that speech casts visible shadows. So the idea is you step into a kind of a magic light. And as you do, uh, you see the shadows of your own speech. And they sort of fly away out of your head. And if a computer speech recognition system is able to recognize what you're saying, then it spells it out. And if it isn't, then it produces a shape which is very phonesthetically tightly coupled to the sounds you made. So let's bring up uh, a video of that. Thanks. So, in this project here, I was working with the great abstract vocalist Yap Blanc, and he's a world expert in performing the Ur Sonata, which is a half an hour nonsense poem by Kurt Schwitters written in the 1920s, which is a uh, half an hour of very highly patterned nonsense. And uh, it's, almost, it's almost impossible to perform, but Yap is one of the world experts in performing it. And in, in this uh, project, we've developed a form of intelligent, real-time subtitles. So these are our live subtitles that are being produced by a computer that knows the text of the Ur Sonata, and fortunately, Yap does too, very well. And uh, it is delivering that text at the same time as Yap is. So all the text you're going to see is real-time generated by the computer, visualizing what he's doing with his voice. Der <laughs> And here you can see the setup where there's a screen with the subtitles behind him. Okay, so, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> the full videos are online if you're interested, and uh, I, I got a split reaction to that during the live performance, because there's some people who understand live subtitles are kind of an oxymoron, because usually there's someone making them in, in, in afterwards. And then a bunch of people who are, who, who, who are like, what's the big deal? I see subtitles all the time on television. You know, they don't imagine the person in the booth typing it all. So, uh, in addition to the full body, and in addition to the voice, uh, another thing that I've been uh, really interested in most recently is the use of the, the eyes, or the gaze, in terms of how people relate to each other. Uh, it's a really profound amount of nonverbal information that's communicated with the eyes, and it's one of the most interesting technical challenges that's very currently active in computer sciences, being able to have a camera that can understand from a, a fairly big distance away how these little tiny balls are actually pointing in one way or another to reveal what you're interested in and where your attention is directed. So, uh, there's a lot of uh, emotional communication that happens there. And so, I've been um, beginning with a variety of different projects to understand how people can relate to machines with their eyes. And basically to ask the questions, what if um, art was aware that we were looking at it? Uh, 
how could it respond in a way to acknowledge or subvert the fact that we're looking at it? And what could it do if it could look back at us? And so those are the questions that are, are happening in the, the next projects. And the first one, which I'm going to show you, called iCode. It's a piece of interactive software in which, um, if we read this little circle, uh, the trace left by the looking of the previous observer looks at the trace left by the looking of the previous observer. The idea is that it's an image wholly constructed from its own history of being viewed uh, by different people in an installation. Uh, so let me just uh, switch over, and I'm going to do the live demo. So uh, let's run this and see if it works. OK, ah, and since there's lots of nice, bright video, there's just a little test screen that shows that it's working. And what I'm just going to do is I'm going to hide that. And you can see here that what it's doing is it says recording my eyes. And every time I blink, hello, and I can, hello. Okay. And no matter where I am, what's really going on here is that this is an eye tracking system that, that tries to locate my eyes. And if I get really far away and, and blurry, you know, you're going to have these kind of blurry spots like this that maybe only resemble eyes in a very, very abstract way. But if I come up really close and stare directly at the camera on this, this laptop, then you'll see these nice crisp eyes. You can think of it as a way of, of, of sort of typing with your eyes. And what you're typing are recordings of your eyes as you are looking at other people's eyes. So each person is looking at the looking of everyone else before them. Uh, and this exists in larger installations where there are thousands and, and thousands of eyes that people could be uh, staring at as you see who's looking at the people looking at the people looking before them. So I, I'll just add a couple more, blink, blink. And you can see just once again how it's sort of finding my eyes and, and doing its best to estimate when it's blinking. All right, let's leave that. So that's this kind of recursive observation system. Thank you. The last couple of pieces I'm going to show are basically in the new realm of robotics for me, new for me. It's called Opto Isolator, and I'm going to show a video of the older version of it, which is just a minute long. Okay. In this case, the Opto Isolator is, uh, is blinking in response to one's own blinks. So it blinks one second after you do. Um, and it, this is a device which is intended to reduce the phenomenon of gaze down to the simplest possible materials, just you know, one eye looking at you and eliminating everything else about a face, but just to consider gaze in an isolated way as a kind of, as an element. Um, and at the same time, it attempts to engage in what you might call sort of familiar psychosocial gaze behaviors, like looking away if you look at it too long because it gets shy uh, or things like that. Okay. So the last project I'm going to show is this new one called Snout. It's an eight-foot snout with a googly eye. And uh, inside, it's got an 800-pound robot arm that I borrowed <laughs> from a friend. Uh, and it helps to have good friends. I'm at Carnegie Mellon. We've got a great robotics institute there. So I'd like to show you this thing called Snout, which is um, the, the idea behind this project is to make a robot that appears as if it's continually surprised to see you. <laughs> so the, the, so the, idea, the idea is that, is that basically it's, if, if, it, if it's constantly like, huh? Huh? That's why it's, 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 uh, its other name is Double Taker, Taker of Doubles. It's always kind of doing a double take. What? And the idea is basically, can it look at you and, um, and make you feel as if, like, what? Is it my shoes? Is it? I got something on my hair? Here we go. All right. Checking them out. <laughs> For you nerds, here's a little behind the scenes. It's got a computer vision system, and it tries to look at the people who are moving around the most. And those are its targets. Up there is the skeleton, which is actually what it's trying to do. <laughs> and 
And it's really about trying to create a novel body language for a new creature. Hollywood does this all the time, of course. Uh, but also have that body language communicate something to the person who's, who's looking at it. That this language is communicating that it's surprised to see you and it's interested in looking at you. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's all I've got for today, and I'm really happy to be here. And thank you so much.